Hi, and welcome to Genius Tea Time with Jenny Jeske. Thanks so much for being here. Um, love, I'm again loving your cups with the legs. Thank you. Um, in Jenny's own words, uh, Jenny is a queer non-binary artist balancing an over-eager calendar with chronic illness. They paint, host art salons, and teach New York City. They are a scenic charge artist at the Juilliard School and draw from their experience in theater and teaching to direct collaborations with their art collective, House of Darker. Jenny has been practicing polyamory for 20 years and finds joy and stability among their chosen family of partners, friends, and muses. Is looking forward to talking with us about the variations of relationships and styles they've uh, observed in their community and how they currently navigate their own romantic attachments to more than one partner. Thank you so much. And can you tell us all about Black Trans Live Thrive? Which is the so group Black that we're Trans in. Lives Thrive is a uh, group that is based on uh, mostly monthly donations. It is uh, run by uh, a friend of mine, Bridget, who also runs another fundraising and activism circle called Kink Out, which does a lot of work with the sex worker community mm. and Red Canary Song, which is a sex worker community led advocism, advocation, which came out of the uh, massage parlor incidents that happened in New York a while ago. So um, for me, as someone who is queer and kinky and um, who has spent time in the burlesque scene, is approaching the cabaret scene right now uh, and is queer, I owe so much of who I am and the freedoms I have to discover who I am and who I'm becoming uh, to trans women, especially Black trans women. And um, the resources that I have far outweigh the resources that most Black trans women in New York City have. And so um, it is upon us, those uh, of us who are more privileged queers, to really um, remember to lift up the whole community with with us. There's... uh, so much freedom i when i was hosting uh when i first started hosting tableau Mm -hmm. um maybe this was maybe seven eight years ago i remember that uh there was someone who came to a tableau and they felt that it wasn't a queer enough space for them but they made some assumptions in that in that not everyone presents in the way i would say is not everyone presents as a fuck you queer. Some people (laughs) pose as a, I play with the binary queer. Some people pose as a, I would like to ignore the binary queer. Uh, Some people go back and forth and mix it all up. And so the fact that this person came in and decided by observing this was not a queer crowd when I know personally, because I am a big slut, that the proportion of people in that crowd that were queer was very, very high. Uh, and you wouldn't know from telling, though, that that was our privilege. You wouldn't know from looking at us necessarily that we were all queer. And some of that mm-hmm. is by choice. Sometimes people in my community do not feel safe being as out. They make slow, you know, movements. I think we've all seen our friends go through, okay, I'm going to allow myself to have a little color in my hair. I'm going to let myself have a tattoo on my lower arm. I'm going to, uh, little you bits know, shave the side of my head just but just one side and I'll, and and then I could cover it up you know everyone goes through the uh not everyone but there are a lot of phases that that go through it and so anyway getting back to the reason that I don't like donating to black trans lives uh black trans lives thrive thrive it's so alliterative it's beautiful but it's hard to remember how to say Uh, is because um, there are people that we interact with at queer events, at sex worker events here in the city. Um, And so it is, uh, it is the, it is part of our community and we see the money going into our community. Um, Another, um, just in case it ever comes across your dashboard, another uh, organization that I 
donate uh, to a lot with fundraisers is Las Estrada, which is also a sex worker uh, relief fund. So um, if you ever see that name attached to anything, know that those are really good people. Um, is the Las Estrada like Lissa Estrada, the play? Yes. Yes. Okay. And probably it's pronounced Lissa Estrada. And even though I have a degree in theater, you know, there's only so many, no so many words you can remember. How to say. <laughs> I don't, I don't know, honestly, that's one of those words that I know about because, um, look, I've, I've seen them written and not something that I've heard said. So I think it's interesting that those who don't know that the reason we know each other is because we did theater together yes. for a decade uh, in Colorado at the Colorado Shakespeare Festival. So that's how we know each other. Yeah. And, um, you know, I thought it would be interesting to talk about how, you know, polyamory is in my life. And how it helps me build a creative, how how it supports my creative circle, and of course how it supports me through chronic illness. Um, but my first idea, my first chosen family, was actually through Colorado Shakespeare Festival and the group of creatives that we called together out there. And uh, so that's how we know each other from the creating of uh, Chosen Creative Family. Was that your that gallery show that we did in the apartment? Was that your first, uh, your uh, first like air experimental gallery show? It was yes. mine anyway. Yes, absolutely. We turned our apartment several times during one season, and after having done a few seasons of figure drawing all together, we decided, yeah. heck, Lisa and I had been collecting all of these pieces of paper that we had painted scenery on, but looked more beautiful without the scenery on it, <laughs> and you had been creating collecting scraps of fabric and stuff in the costume shop. And we just put together a show on assemblage. And then I think we did a show for Kara and her self portraits. And yes. we, we just did several in our apartment and yeah. every, and we had lots of friends who came and we just made it for ourselves. It was just delightful. It really was. Yeah. That idea of chosen family. Do you want to sort of expound on that and how that's really brought you Absolutely. Well, uh, you know, it's interesting because it was while I was at Colorado mm -hmm. uh, that I really came upon the, the fact of that there was polyamory. Um, I was definitely mm. aware that I loved more than one person at a time. And I just thought, well, that's how your heart is. I guess that's the, you have to figure out how to not do that. Like, or not how to not how to not love people, but how to follow whatever the rules would be of navigating the relationships with the person I was in. And who knows what might be able to be negotiated, but it didn't seem very open. Mm. And then to tell you the truth, when I learned a little bit about polyamory, just a little bit, I thought that meant that I would have to date an old wizard man who had seven submissives who lived with him. <laughs> and that's the type of life that I would have to live. And that really didn't appeal to me either. Mm. And so uh, when I met someone at the Colorado Shakespeare Festival who uh, let me know before he kissed me that I would like to kiss you, but you should know that I have a girlfriend, but I've already talked to her about you and how charmed I am by you. I was like, that sounds okay with me. <laughs> and then he handed me the ethical slut. And great entry. All right. The entry. And, you know, so um, right now, I think one of the best books uh, on uh, polyamory is Polysecure, which has come out in the past few years. But back at that time, The Ethical Slut was the book. And someone correct me if I'm wrong, because there's a few people here that might know, but that was kind of one of the best books back there in the 90s. And um you I'm, know, I really enjoyed parts of that book and times I threw it across the room because I thought, no, I can't do this. <laughs> and um, but it really made a lot of sense to me. And so when I came back to New York after that summer, I started looking at everyone in my life a little bit differently and not in a kind of could I get with them way, but of this spectrum of what is romance, what is creativity, what is sexual, and how, if I don't have to have just one person here and everyone else here, how much potential is there for 
different levels of friendship to exist around each other. So I already started thinking about it in ways of um, potential, but it was very hard to learn how to navigate emotionally at first because where I was socialized to Mm. give most of my attention to one person. And that if I was doing that, and then there was someone else over here that they would be lacking because I was over here Mm. or, or this person would not be okay if I was over here sometimes. And so, you know, you can't just read a book and it's like the matrix and it's in your head and you get it. I mean, I can't read a book like that. So it's not like I could impart every lesson and not one book is going to give me every lesson on polyamory, right? So what I had to do was I had to kind of figure it out for myself. And I had to figure out what that meant about how I represented myself when I was dating. And I started to see very different types of people. I saw people who wanted to talk about who they were with, with everyone, people who didn't want to talk about what they were doing with everyone. And I realized that for me, I like the types of people who are comfortable enough and confident enough in their place in my life. And I can help them with that, that they want to hear about what's going on in my life because my joy is their joy. Nice. And the same in reverse. And that sometimes people refer to that as kitchen table, Polly, you know, because you can all wake up in the morning and have coffee together after being in various bedrooms. It doesn't have to be (laughs) that communal. Um, But that is what works for me because of some of my insecure attachment uh, habits uh, have led me to need more, a little more reassurance sometimes. And um, there are people who are there and who want to work on that with me and who want to share that with me and who want to be in a relationship that does that. And, you know, sometimes people change the way they feel about things. And so just like how you might grow in and out of love with a person, you could grow in and out of love with a relationship style. I was dating someone for three years and eventually our, the way we started dating was not fitting the way she wanted to date. And so that didn't work anymore. And yeah. that is something that, you know, uh, it's just another piece, but people yeah. themselves are so complicated with our jobs and our interests and our everything that goes on with us. And then of course we, we were going to layer on, uh, on top of that. Uh, everyone has something going on with their body. Everyone is dealing with something. Everyone is figuring something out. And so yeah, someone's relationship style is just another thing that makes them who they are. And each there so there are multiple people in my life who ha- I have most mul- different types of relationships with different people. And while I don't look at people and go, "Oh, look, there's Jack. I really do need a graphic designer." <laughs> <laughs> let's flirt with him jack who is on here right now and he has the bow tie and the glasses there um it is quite convenient <laughs> it is quite wonderful when i'm talking with jack about a program and i'm just you know trying to talk it out with him as someone who i share ideas with and he's like you mean something like this yeah well we could do this like this and we can fold it like this and Me. oh that would be real easy and i go really And it's not just having, to be really honest, it's not just having other people's ideas. (laughs) It, as someone with chronic illness who uh, deals with a lot of chronic pain, it's the fact that someone wants to support my work and is interested in what I'm doing enough to say, I'll put a little labor into this. This sounds fun. And that the other people who you're hanging out with who think this sounds like fun too are probably going to be fun to hang out with. And so this is probably going to be a great party or great art gathering or a great art salon. And that's kind of um, how community has built. And then I tend to find my partners through those types of creative exchanges. So. Um, Jack is, uh, my partner. We've been together for 13 years. 
I have a husband, Walter, who lives with me. We've been together for 16 or 17 years, something like that. Oh, and wow. uh, he's a photographer and he documents all of my events for me. Um, you know, how wonderful is that? That's neat. It's so wonderful. You know, when he doesn't really take a, let's get down and make a list and figure out what you need and figure out who's going to get the ice and who's going to get the plates. He's not, he's not involved in that sort of stuff, but he comes okay. and he documents. I have um, a partner, Brittany Marie, who I've been with for five years and um, you know, she's just wonderful. And again, like I didn't say, Oh, look, there's someone who works in development. <laughs> who works in development, but I can tell you it's really nice when I'm writing something on some copy and they say, Oh, you don't have to be that nice. Be more direct, right? Nice. Someone's like, give me that clipboard. I'll check people in. I'm good at that. You go do the next task you want to do. We hosted a party um, just last Friday night. And I had had such a hard day at work that around mm. 11 o'clock when I was done and we were winding up, I was in a lot of pain. And the next morning I woke up in a lot more pain than I expected to be. And do you know, Brittany Marie insisted. No, you know what? I'm going to say that differently. She didn't insist. She asked if I would please let her go back to my studio and clean up without me. Aww. And talk Aww. about not feeling like a burden. Yeah. Talk about feeling loved and supported and someone going, this is something I would like to do. I'm not doing it because I feel I need to do for it. I know you could do it. I know you'll be better tomorrow. I know you can do it. So to sort of uh, obviously... I'm making some large jumps from topic to topic, but I think I want to yeah. jump one more topic as to like how actually with how I think it's wonderful that just like with having multiple partners or chosen family, uh, which could be anything from our group, our gaggle of friends who ate dinner on the deck together almost every night out in Colorado, <laughs> just because even though we spent all day at work together, for some reason, we still wanted to keep hanging out. So we all ate our asparagus and our salads next to each other outside, right? Yeah. Everything from that type of group of solidity of people to people who I'm sharing a bed with and sharing more intimacy with. There are people who have strengths, people who have different schedules, people who have different talents. And no. Oh. People can help me in different ways and I can help them in different ways because I have some abilities just like I have some disabilities. And so I have felt that, um, you know, it is really nice to be able to know that if I was really sick, yeah. that someone would come maybe help Walter with the dog if he had to go to work. Yeah, and that Somebody. I know that, uh, you know, if Jack wasn't doing so well and I couldn't do everything I need to do for him, that Walter and Brittany Marie would just come in and help. Brittany Marie just shattered her ankle the other day. I'm going to give Eli, her husband, a break and go over and take care of her for a day. And I wanted to clean the house, but they're getting a housekeeper so they don't kill each other. So that's good well. on that. <laughs> sometimes you can't do it all yourself and you yeah. have to shop it out. It is yeah. true. It's so important. It's just so important. I mean, especially with chronic illness. You have to figure out where, where it's not worth your time and effort, where it's actually worth it to ask someone else who's good at something to do it and to pay them for it. And that's been a, I think a hard thing for me as someone who was raised by someone who was a perfectionist cleaner oh, no. to realize that <laughs> I can hire someone and they can do a good enough job. And it's only good enough because my father's behind me right here doing yap yap. They're doing a great job. Do you know what I'm saying? <laughs> but like, yeah, you yeah. Know, your father's I'm, in your head. Your father's like, my father, did you get the behind the toaster? Me I shouldn't <laughs> tip unless it's done perfectly up to his standards. And it's like, you know what? First of all, my standards are different. Second of all, there's only so much you can do in four hours. And, um, ah, it's it's been it's uh it's been wonderful to realize oh it's really just 
nice to have a clean tub. It doesn't matter that it's not perfect. It's lovely to have a nice clean tub. And if I only spent the amount of time that they spend, it also would not be perfect. <laughs> There's Actually, that. Perfection is a myth, you know. <laughs> and a, not a useful one. It isn't. It isn't. Uh, no. What what got you into uh, the art salons? What made you think? Oh, it's because it seems like such a direct thing from what we did at Colorado Shakes. It okay. Is. So we started with these salons, these art gallery nights that we did, and I love them. And um, I was starting to uh, attend and host a lot of very sexy, salacious parties. I got involved with, at the time I had a Dom and um, he had no primary partner at the time. So me as a secondary partner sort of ended up doing a lot of the stuff that his previous primaries had done, like organized parties with him and such. And so all of a sudden we started hosting a lot of things as uh, the Dirty Gentleman and Dorothy Darker. And that was really, really wonderful. And I loved it. Mm hmm. And I started going to more parties and I loved it. But you know what? It's really hard. All of a sudden you're talking to another painter. And uns, 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 mm -hmm. uns. It's like, wait a second. Like, I can hardly hear you <laughs> talking to people about their creative work. I had so much in common with so many of the people who I was meeting at these parties. And, and it's just a techno no beat and you can't hear anything. And we had no place to really talk about Mm. That stuff. And also, I wanted to know these people as my whole person, not just my persona that I brought to a fetish party. And so my muse at the time, Elsha, well, she's also my, she's still my muse. <laughs> Elsha, who, uh, you know, models for me and helps me host parties and has just been a stalwart partner for over a decade. Um, she and I were like, she has opera training. She was uh, so she's also uh, from the arts and we said you know holy moly wouldn't it be nice to get these friends together that we know are so creative and so talented and take them out of these uh loud components and bring together smaller art focused parties nice. so first they were like studio parties with themes mm -hmm. and then uh both inspired by what we did and also some friends of mine, Allison and Garrett, who also did art salons. We did nice. some more very focused salons with themes where we would invite people to bring something on theme. Okay. Did that for a while. And those, those were, um, it was nice because we could invite more people to them too, because there's only a certain, yeah. uh, quadrant of my life that I would feel comfortable inviting to see the beauty of the type of salacious parties, even with all the flowers and hors d'oeuvres and everything that was there to want to show off that beauty. Not everyone's comfortable in those environments. Yeah. Yeah. In art salon environment, a lot more people could be part of it. Yeah. And so um, oh, that's neat. what I did. And they were very private. They were private invite only for a long time. And then uh, I got a uh, invite through a friend of mine who was working at an event space called uh, Lot 54. Lot, Lot, Jack, what is it? Lot 45, Lot 45. Um, okay. In Bushwick. Okay. Um, they wanted to do a drink and draw or maybe a kink and draw. And I was like, well, obviously I'd love to host another drawing event, but there are so many drawing events. What could we do to mm -hmm. make it a little bit more something yeah a and little so more intriguing what we decided to do was um have different themes each month and sometimes the themes would be like um oh excellent thanks Jack. thank you um sometimes the themes would be about a specific artist <coughs> or a specific era mm, sometimes nice. they would be about a specific fetish Sometimes they would sure. be around a specific uh, character um, hmm. and sometimes they'd just be about a fun theme back to school and we would uh, sure. have 
times when we would have photographers there so that people could enjoy making pictures with them. We would have uh, times when we would do markets so people could bring their artwork and their writing and their books mm, nice. and their pottery. And again, we're taking people who we build it as queer and kinky at first. Mm -hmm. So um, you had people coming in from all of these various places. We're like, I've seen you in... <laughs> I think I've seen you in a latex mask before. <laughs> I'm not sure we've ever talked. And uh, all of a sudden people are like trading Instagrams and having studio visits and they're oh, reading nice. books. And Jack actually would do a writing prompt with people. I would do drawing. I would offer a little instruction if someone wanted it. Um, we would uh, sometimes have musical events. Sometimes we'd have performances. Sometimes we'd show films that people had made. Nice. And it was uh, a Tuesday every month. And it went on for five years before the pandemic. Yeah. And um, it really grew and changed. And it became a place where my scenic artist apprentices and friends would come it became less mm -hmm. less overtly fetishy and kinky and more focused on the creativity but it was a space where someone could explore and meet people who maybe were not in monogamous relationships mm -hmm. but also they didn't have to feel like they were outing themselves by being in this space so Got as it. we continue to move on with this with tableau we started pulling back the the forward the kink forwardness of it mm-hmm so that more people could come without feeling like if a picture of them was taken, that they would be incriminated. Yeah. Without it. Yeah. And that's an issue for, so, is. for a lot of people. And unfortunately, I think it might become more of an issue before it becomes less of an issue. Unfortunately. Yeah. Especially now. What a week, what a week right? Oh, oh brutal. Uh, so. And the the putting down tableau to me oh what, what were you saying i was just putting down tableau in our chat oh excellent um i think that the next salon that i want to do i was mm -hmm. talking about this with my friend uh natasha who's actual her photos are right here she's from oh lovely different shoots we've done different trips we've taken over the years oh this glass is falling off that piece there we go oh. um we, I want to do a salon where people are bringing incomplete work, either work they're stuck Ooh. on, work they're done with, and they don't want to work on anymore, and okay. talk about it. Not to talk through it, but to talk about what happens when that happens. Yeah. And yeah. And other people go through it. Because that's, yeah, it's such a big thing. I mean, I can, there's such a tie in to me about the creative life and what you're doing with your relationship life and your, the way, like, that kind of communication about it is so important. Mm. I do really think that the communication skills that you do garner from needing to be very clear with other people. <laughs> uh, can help you facilitate and ask hard questions of yourself in the studio. Oh yeah. And I think it can lead, it can lead you to uh, asking other people hard questions in their studio. Neat. Which what a gift when someone can come into your space and ask you a question that stumps you. Right. Yeah, it is. I mean, it's like when, and there are questions that I'm asked in romantic relationships that stump me and I don't know the answer. Someone can say, how would you feel about if I blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, honestly, I don't know. So let's figure Which this is out. shocking that I don't have an opinion right away, but I, I don't. <laughs> so I'm yeah. not sure. And how do you make peace in those I'm not sure moments, which is goes yeah. back to those places of the I'm not sure art. Where yeah. are we? Um, when the art has to shift, when your life has to shift, when your life has to shift and 
you know, when I first started doing the immersive performance art events, which if you go to my website, um, which is DorothyDarker.com or JennyStanjeski.com. I will put that uh, up. You'll see that there's Bacchanals and there's a Brazai type event. And there's many different events that are like fully immersive things where I made the costumes. I actually did people's hair and makeup as a hello, um, you know, so I could greet each one of them. It was they were true labors of love and I would be absolutely physically exhausted. In fact, the one that's uh, mostly black and white pictures, that was Brazai. I dislocated my knee the week before and still insisted on doing it. Had to, could it not do it? I had put too much into it. We weren't going to not do it, but I can't work that much anymore. And the last one I did that was that big Mm -hmm. was uh, an autumnal Bacchino. And it was kind of a revisitation of trying to bring down the muses. And Mm. I did not do a good job of learning from my diagnosis yet. Ooh. And I set myself the same bar that I was going to make everyone's costumes. I was going to do this. I was going to do that. And I pushed through kind of miserably. And at the end of that project, I couldn't channel or remember much of the joy of it, which is uh, absolutely not the point. Yeah. And I would know nothing about this. (laughs) No, no, no. Uh, because there can never be too much whimsy. Never, yeah. never. No. <laughs> oh, and whimsy now. <laughs> when I was uh, done with that, I realized, I realized that how I did art, and I have to tell you, those who were with me, mm-hmm. my chosen family, also were very kindly saying, Dorothy, you have to change how you do this. You can't do this anymore. Yeah. And it's too much. because I was tense, so they were tense. Oh. Uh, I was in pain. They could see I was in pain. They were uncomfortable about it. I wasn't at my best. And um, yeah, it took a lot of. At first, I just thought. At first, I didn't understand how I would do it because I thought that my expression was the doing as a maker. I didn't know how (laughs) to not do the making because I felt like every brushstroke needed to be mine or I was cheating. Yeah. It wasn't even about getting it right. Like my father and the bathtub. Yeah. It was about doing it. Yeah. And I, I, um, I think the first, the biggest event that I've done since then, Mm -hmm. post-COVID, was something I did November 3rd this past year, Mm -hmm. where I kind of let go a little bit of uh, the duality between Dorothy Darker and Jenny Stanjeski or Jenny Jeski, Mm -hmm. uh, because I I felt very bifurcated. Mm -hmm. I felt very much like there was the after dark, and then Uh there was daytime so is Dorothy and, Darker more of one more yes. of the earlier character more of an earlier character and very much more all of uh you know the tumblr pre uh all of the porn and fetish being kicked off of it um mm-hmm. and very much uh connected with all of the uh kink and BDSM parties I had been hosting and all the fetish forward um, polyamory type stuff. And I felt like I, uh, well, we all changed so much during COVID. We all wondered who we were because of who were we with anymore? Who are we still connected to? What are we still doing? What are our aims and our priorities now? And also over COVID, I lost a decade long partner, the person who I was hosting many of those parties with, we decided to no longer be partners. Mm. And so um, that name was so synonymous with his. Got it. That it felt like I needed to, well, it started off 
that I thought, Laura, that I was going to let go of Dorothy and then she would go poof away and then it would be Jenny all the time because I could just do it. If I did a ritual and I did it earnestly enough, I could make it happen. But and of course, but Dorothy is you <laughs> as well. So I, I, I know, and you, know. you know what? It's shocking for me to understand that it's yeah. a creation of mine that Jenny made Dorothy. That Dorothy it's your own me. art, literally. It's my own me. <laughs> and so, you know, it's very interesting because I started my invite for everyone coming to this event that it was going to be this transformation, this, you know, letting go, this, this, this casting off of. And then the whole lesson of the whole evening is, you know, in almost all of my ritual events up until then i had asked people to what would you give away to the muses to get mm. something for if you could let go of something in your life that would make your life better what could you let go of i've been mm. asking people to process and let go and and purge and do all these different things you know what i've never asked people to do to just accept something about themselves Ah, oh, life is and for learning, right? <laughs> that was the whole lesson for yeah. me and of that. I had to have the process of making it happen. I had to make the show. I had to make the event. I had to try and get rid of her to realize that she and they are all one. And so like, you know, I, when I'm doing a cabaret showcase in a few weeks, um, ever since I was a kid, I always thought that I wanted to be at some point in my life, either a lounge lizard or a cabaret singer. And I always thought at some, I always thought at that age that I would have to be in my forties or fifties, at least to be as grizzled and <laughs> um, cynical as those characters you ah, really ah, seem to be. Ah, you know, I didn't really get that you could be Amy Winehouse and have that much live in done in that much time. But, you know, that's a special person of another level, right? Yeah. So um, I have been taking some voice lessons and I put Yay. myself in a cabaret class. And um when I was 16, I went to my first real cabaret at Don't Tell Mamas in New York City. Okay. And this showcase is at Don't Tell Mamas in New York City. Oh, so, that's so oh, good. I'm so glad oh, for you. That, that, and so <sighs> when I go on stage, you know, uh, I was asking my friend Nathaniel, mm -hmm. who uh, runs um, hair and makeup at Juilliard. I was asking him, mm -hmm. would he help me? pick out my outfit because he's just he's got such good taste so he's like of course I will and he's like but I think you should just wear that gold the gold dress that I saw and I was like oh the one I wore this New Year's Eve he's like yes just wear that and I was like well that's a Dorothy dress and then I was like Jenny stop doing that <laughs> and I that's mean, also you a character you created me, and also I get to wear that dress too it also fits me <laughs> And but you know what it does do? It yeah. lets me call on some of that. Uh, when I hosted things as Dorothy, I had come up with an, I had come up with a way for someone who grew up rather shy. And Laura, you met me when I was shy. Yes. Yes. Which I wouldn't describe myself as shy anymore. But I was <laughs> at one point, yeah. and. Dorothy really helped me get bold by having this drag persona that sort of represented everyone from Liza Minnelli to Klinger on MASH to so many <laughs> characters that I just felt really had something gorgeous about them that I felt I wanted to embody. Yeah. And I can bring that up on stage with me being myself because they're my influences. Yeah. That's um, wonderful. I just, so yeah. That's where we've ended up. And, you know, I took this class last year and I had to drop out because I was too sick. Mm. And I took it again. 
and I was having a problem with my meds. And I told the teacher, I just want you to know if I have to drop out, it's only because I'm dealing with this and this makes it a very long day for me and my medicine wears out at this point. And sometimes the pain is just too much. Mm. And he said to me, well, I want to do something. I want to make an accommodation. If you're having a bad day, please tell me you're going to go first and then you're going to go home. That's awesome. And Brittany Marie asked me when I told her this story, she said, how does it make you feel? I said, I don't feel like it's fair. (laughs) But we have to learn how to accept these things in order to, because we give them to other people, right? And I want other people to have uh, the, the accessibility that they need. And something that you said yesterday when we were catching up is I think is really important is, uh, disability advocacy is so far behind so many other types of advocacy. In this so country. far. <laughs> and the fact that I could tell my teacher that I was having issues like that and he could just decide to make that accommodation is um, because he has chronic pain, because he knows. If he Got didn't, it. he might not have had that in his back pocket. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm really very fortunate. And so I'm lucky that this time with that accommodation, and I actually haven't had to use it because I have to tell you, knowing I can leave reduces the tension of me feel it, fearing that yeah. I can't make it through. And I've actually been able to make it through. And he's such an entertaining teacher. Watching him teach is just that helps. Amazing. So uh, I'm going to take all of that up on stage with me on the 12th. And um, I'm so excited to do it. And I'm so excited to do it as a combination of Jenny and Dorothy. Nice. I'm so excited to do it likely in flats. And that's okay. You it'll know? be okay. <laughs> it'll be okay. Um, and uh, I'm going to have a gaggle of people there's already 12 to 15 people who have said they're gonna come to my student showcase how silly is that how wonderful is it but how silly is that because we all know what student showcases are like oh lord oh lord (laughs) so you have to be someone who is really this this makes me feel really good because what i've collected around me is a bunch of people who are there for watching their friends and other people stretch themselves creatively, not be perfect, but be brave. That's so exciting and wonderful. Yeah. Yay. I'm excited to be brave. I am excited for you. I'm going to start asking if anybody else wants to have a, have questions add in, you can always do that in the chat. If you would prefer not to speak, that is okay. Mm-hmm. Thank you for right. the heart. Oh. I, I, I love this. Is this an easel, Rebecca, that you have next to you? I think that it is Your that. Oh, it's part of an art piece. It's beautiful, whatever it is. I'm a huge fan of Louise Nevelson, and it has oh, yeah. big Nevelson vibes for me. Yes, that's, was- that's fair. Mm-hmm. I was telling her a little bit about your piece, Central Sensitization. Look, I got it almost. <laughs> you did. You is did. that is that the piece? No. no, no, no. That one is more um, enormous, house sized. I can pull that up. Mm-hmm. But um, if you would like to talk about chronic illness in general, please do. Yeah, absolutely. I could talk about mine, but Rebecca, I'd love to hear about what you're going through and how how that impacts your work and vibe with you on that. Well, I mean, what you were talking about in terms of, um, I mean, I'm literally laying here wearing compression boots that are yes. that are like an hour of, you know. I have a pair. I don't know why I didn't get them beforehand. I don't know why. Right? Yes. No, it's huge. Um, I mean, my genius tea time was about, um, it's, it was called chronically gifted, chronically ill. Yep. Uh, the tie-in between the two things. Yeah. Amazing. And I sit on the board of the world's only organization that looks at gifted gift physiology. Um, and why is it that particularly highly profoundly gifted people are twice as likely to be chronically ill in some fashion? Um, I had and it's no true. idea. 
We are. It's called. It's it's a it's a theory. Welcome. <laughs> hyper, hyper body, hyper brain. Yeah. Wow. Um, so I just friended you on a bunch of different socials, and we're so <laughs> is your genius tea time recorded? Yes, it is. Yeah. It's up okay, on the YouTube. I I'm gonna have to go back and listen to yes, that. Yes, and you. Yes. I mean, Laura said I needed to show up today. I mean, <laughs> you know, Laura knows. I mean, I have a. I have I'm merely a- saying that I think you have things in the comment. <laughs> I'm oh, yeah. glad you friended me. I'm sure we're gonna be fast friends. <laughs> yeah. I mean, first off. You know, I, I mean, I have a trans mask teen son and I'm a huge, I'm his biggest fan as Laura knows. Um, and um, Laura is also a huge fan of my son. Laura helped him design, uh, helped him implement and sew the pants that he designed for his senior prom. Oh my God. Amazing. He was so thrilled when he came up and just like, look at this. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so, and I sit on the, I also sit on the board of a trans organization here in LA, um, <clears throat> that helps families and figure things out and like not freak out and be like, this is all awesome and support your kid. It's all wonderful. Um, so, and I'm on the board of a, of a, of a study being done out of UMass Boston. Anyway, all of that stuff. So like things. the fact that you were supporting uh, black trans stuff. I was like, yeah, sure. Take my money. Um, but, um, but Laura and I were talking this week and, and she was like, you should definitely come because you guys have this chronic illness thing. So I have a thing called mast cell activation syndrome. Me too. (laughs) And I have a thing and, and from what you're talking about, and I have a thing called, um, hypermobility EDS. Yes, I do too. I have the triumphant. So So you have plots as well. Yeah, Pot, so you have dysautonomia. Yeah. Mass cell activation syndrome. Here we are. Oh, yes, so my talk was literally about how gifted brains, in particular those who are highly sensitive people, of which creatives are primarily the class, how that interacts with vagus nerve activity and how that activity um, sets up flares around the triumvirate. Have you seen muscle music yet? No. That's a link I'm going to write down to send you. Okay. Um, so uh, she is someone who works in the performing arts and she basically te- she does courses that talk about sympathetic uh, nervous system management within the performing arts and how um, both as a performer uh, you need to have that stuff on lockdown before you go down the lanes of uh, acting through these emotional triggers we're talking about. But also something that she said the other day, which is one of the reasons why I started following her. I saw some content like this as a as someone who does any type of leading or community building oftentimes will be in a position where we think we need to mirror those who come to us for help. And so we put ourselves in a position where we put our bodies, which are already possibly chronically ill, through a a sympathetic nervous system jolt of emotion, of sensitivity to their trauma. We get into the place with them and then we leave and then we are worn out in a way as if something happened to us. And so it is important for us for two reasons to try and stay in a place of, it might feel cold at first, but in a place of care, but not mirroring one for ourselves, but two, so they can mirror calmness. Yeah. And that blew me away. And I really wish I had those, that tool, that thought in the beginning when I first started doing art salons, because I think I would end up so exhausted after them because people would feel so seen by me. And that's really great. But also I would take on so much. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it seems like that's something you've learned as well. Oh, definitely. Definitely. It's, um, yeah, I mean, uh, I do a lot of community engagement. I mean, I, 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 I'm the person that basically founded with another, with an architect, an organization in 2009 called Broodwork, which was mentioned in the New York Times way back when. Um, we were the first organization to do, um, to talk about creative practice and family life. 
in terms of how there was plenty of organizations that were like about how people who wanted to be mothers um, yes. should also be able to be artists, but we weren't talking about the wholeness of creative practice and family life in terms of also how we do chosen family and how we parent each other and you know how like in some queer families people adopt each other so that they can provide medical care for each other yes. but, yeah. but how like how parenting works and and how like at some point we're like the responsible generation where we're parenting our 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 kids but we're also parenting our own parents you know like and just how all of that works within creative. I was, we were the first people to do that. And now there's a bunch of people that are doing it, but it's, um, and I've done other kinds of, you know, um, community engagement things for five years. I mean, I started, I founded, started and ran a therapy dog program at a residential facility for boys um, to pull them out of, you know, when like talk therapy was never gonna pull them out of um, initial stages of, of their trauma, right? Like there's a million ways in which we do all of this. And then all of my social engagement projects and all of my giant site specifics that have involved other people in the making, right? Like we slowly figure that out. And as Laura knows, I've basically just cleared out my studio. I'm not making art anymore for, I don't know how long it may be forever. It may be for a while because my body is just so done. <laughs> void. Yeah. I was talking to Jack this morning. Yeah. about how I need to clear the thing. So I used to have a 750 square foot studio with an adjoining 600 square foot uh, studio that I could rent out sometimes. And so that allowed me to throw parties for 125 people. And it was really wonderful and I loved it. And when I moved out of that studio, I kept a lot of these things so that like, you know, hangers and, uh, racks so that I could have the coats of at least 60 people at a time. I'm not going to need that. And no, it's taking and it's up so much problem. time. It's not a responsibility. It's yeah. not. And it's I, I need to get this stuff out of my studio so that there's more room for who I am now. Yep. And so what I'm curious is, is there anyone else here who, as they've been dealing with what their body needs or what their mind needs, what their brain needs, anything that's changed about how they've been going about their work and what has changed and what have they had to let go of? Because I think that that's something that's very interesting to me. Yeah. Well, Robin, I know that you've been having to make some changes both because of different um, life situations, but also because of room and what you end up needing to pare down to. Um, I know, did you want to talk on that? Yeah. No. <laughs> That's totally okay. That's totally okay. But no, I mean, anytime, I think anytime your life makes a shift, you need to yeah. figure out what, for whatever reasons, whether it's really pragmatic or, you know, you're just deciding some things don't work anymore. How do yeah. you, how do you readjust your life? for that. How do you let go and be like, that's not what I do anymore. Yeah. And be open to what is new. Um, it's tricky. It is. In my brain, I want to link that back to the idea of the salon of the stunted work. Right? Like, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. How can I bring in the stuff that I decided I'm no longer doing, but bringing it to a dinner table to talk about it and yeah. maybe maybe crack it open a little bit more like an egg and really figure out ah what is in there what is in there and and maybe like how my uh November project went maybe I'll be like actually some of this stuff I'm gonna keep maybe yeah. when I get to the big container of fake grapes and um <laughs> flowers I'm gonna be like you know what I actually want to dip these in wax and do something with them and then maybe I'm gonna come to all of these three huge boxes of fabrics that I made all of the tunics for Bacchanal 60 or 70 people's worth of fabric and I'm gonna say you know what I'm not gonna do anything with it and there are some lovely places where you can donate them if you want exactly. to exactly exactly 
I mean, it is, it's all, uh, it's all lining material. <laughs> so who knows, who knows what someone could do with it, but someone can make it into something, you know what yeah. I mean? It's fiber, it go into something, but it doesn't need to be sitting in boxes underneath the bed in my studio, waiting for me to reimagine another Bacchanal, because I don't think that they're, you know, we don't, I don't need to keep repeating myself. I'm a new, I'm a new, I'm a new artist with a new it, body. Yeah. And um, in a new know, situation. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I have gotten mobility back and I've gotten executive function back and I have been very lucky, but I have to guard it Yeah, and I have to treat it differently. And I think that, uh, you know, all of us have to do that to a certain extent as we age, we have to figure out what does our body do now? What does our body not do anymore? Yeah. And um, that takes some big acceptance. And also, you know, those good conversations about really communicating not only with partner, but yourself, what, what do I need? I right. love that when we were catching up, like talking about this, so much it is, what do I need? What do I need now? Right. What do I need? Um, that's the biggest question I ask myself when I'm making work. What do I need? Why am I doing this? What, what am I doing this for? What do I need? How can I be most genuine to myself about it? And then figuring out what it is I need help with and putting yeah. it out there and seeing if someone wants to do it. Um, we oh, totally nervous system re regulation. Mm -hmm. That's yeah, exact, that's exactly what muscle music the the thing that I'm going to send you a link to is all about. Yeah. Okay. Have you tried holotropic breathing or like really heavy duty breathing stuff? Those are fabulous. I I one of the things I really love about breathing exercises is that you don't have to believe in anything woo. It's science. And whether you believe it or not, if you if you breathe in a pattern, it's literally going to change what's happening in your body. And so when I teach, so I teach painting, I teach scenic art. I also teach drawing on the side and do, uh, you know, smaller one-on-one -on -one things. But so I'm teaching people who are not just being artists, but they're being physical laborers as artists. And um, you know, theater's fast paced, things go wrong. You have to uh, learn how to roll with it. And um, oftentimes I teach them, I'm not just teaching you how to paint floors, I'm teaching you how to manage expectations. I'm not just teaching you how to paint walls, I'm teaching you how to manage yourself. And my second year with these students, so I teach, I go to a school and I have a year with this, with students uh, in their first year and their second year at this um, specific trade school. Um, the second year I teach them all about how they can deal with their sympathetic nervous system and their parasympathetic nervous system and how the types of impressions they could make if they are nervous or having a problem, if they just take five minutes before they go to their boss or their coworker to regulate and all the different ways, maybe reaching out to a, a safe friend to regulate, maybe it's breathing, maybe it's having a sip of water, but there are so many things. Um, there is, uh, Jack, maybe you could look this up for me and put it in the, in the chat. Uh, I'm awful and uh, and everything's awful and I'm not okay. If you just Google that. Yes. There is a, do you know what I'm talking about, Laura? Yeah, I do. There is a, um, basically a list of 10 things that you can do to your body, like that you can check in about that, uh, in any situation you're in, everything's awful and I'm not okay. There's a PDF. There's 16 versions of that PDF floating around. <laughs> and I give that I give a feelings wheel because sometimes just knowing actually that you're angry, you're not, you're not scared is really helpful. Um, and um, I uh, teach them some breathing. Um, I'm curious uh, if anyone else has any tools that they like using that they, that they go to all the time. I mean, I keep a feelings wheel in my damn purse sometimes. So 
I'm all about just knowing how to talk about it. And I've got I've I'll got some meditation good. tactics as well. Um, but um, oh, wonderful! Hmm? Do you follow Trauma Geek? Um, I'll I'll bring, I'll pull her I'll pull her up because she's actually great. She's brilliant, and is definitely a, a, an amazing neurodivergent, uh, non-binary, brilliant, fabulous person who is making some incredible graphics and can always use. Um, yeah. I mean, she's, oh, she's, wonderful, she's, wonderful. And, and do you know Gender Sauce? No. That's also making some really great graphics that often have to do with nervous system stuff. So we'll we'll uh we'll go back and forth. We'll go back and forth and share those. It's so wonderful to um when I I find the Sorry, my train of thought is drifting just a little bit. Was... Oh, I lost it. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. I, I am bringing in gender sauce to the chat. I just got Excellent. diagnosed with very severe ADHD about two weeks ago, speaking of not being able to keep a train of thought. It and is, it's it a, is a thing to manage. Problem. Yes, you too. Yes. Of course, right? I, I wouldn't be surprised if we had some ancestry that's the same. <laughs> I would either. Your your name means you're like you're at least part Ashkenazi, right? Like it's uh no, but I am Polish. Yeah. So and and, and so I could be, but it is not, you know. So yeah. it's uh it's very interesting how these genetic uh mutations can actually be traced back to different places in the world. And a lot of us who have different genetic mutations, um, even more dependable than the genetic testing is actually, oh, just where are you from? Yeah, frequently. And then who in your family did you see limping when you were younger? And that's that's where you probably got from. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. It, yeah. it's sometimes that easy to try to tie it down though yeah oh well, thank you all so much this is really great is does anyone else have any other questions welcome welcome all it's right. been wonderful talking laura this thank has been so, so good i'm so glad you could do this with me and thank I you all for really being here flattered. i was flattered to be asked um situ uh subjects i love rambling on about and um, Robin, lovely to meet you. Rebecca, so great to keep in touch with you. Misa, thank you for the hearts that you sent over. Alex, thank you for coming and listening. Uh, Jack, of course, thank you. And Kat, it was so nice to see you. And um, I uh, wish us all well in our creative endeavors. And Let's have a good evening. Let's do it again. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye.